welcome to Sage Advice, where we interview some of our wonderful Florence Belsky advisors. And this week we have an amazing guest, Zane Busby. Zane Busby is a television comedy director with over 200 network sitcoms, pilots, and specials to her credit, including Golden Girls, Blossom, and Married with Children. She's also an award-winning humanitarian and recipient of the CNN Hero Award for her international work benefiting Holocaust survivors in Eastern Europe. She founded the Survivor Mitzvah Project, a 501c3, which brings direct and continuous emergency aid to thousands of the last survivors of the Holocaust in nine countries, Belarus, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Moldova, Slovakia, Transnistria, Ukraine, and parts of Russia, who are in desperate need of food, medicine, heat, shelter, and some love and kindness. Zane has received multiple other awards for her humanitarian endeavors, leadership, and work in Holocaust education. She's received the ADL Anti-Defamation League's Deborah Award, the International Mensch Foundation Award, the Public Television's KCET's Local Hero Award. The Survivor Mitzvah Project has been recognized by the Simon Wiesenthal Center in Los Angeles and Jerusalem and the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. The organization has received a gold seal of approval from GuideStar and Best Nonprofits. Wow. Welcome, Zane. Thank you. Absolutely incredible biography. I'm so grateful to be sitting with you and eager to learn more about Survivor Mitzvah Project. So let's start here. What What is it more specifically and how did it get started? Well, the Survivor Mitzvah Project is a nonprofit organization. It's a grassroots effort to bring emergency aid to the last survivors of the Holocaust who are scattered all across Eastern Europe. And they're really in desperate need. They haven't been helped since the war. Some of them have been waiting for 80 years to be recognized as a survivor. So uh, our goal is really that no human being who survived the darkest days of human history, who survived the Holocaust, man, woman, or child, would ever be hungry or neglected or in need again. And that's what we want, you know, want to do and what we work towards. So, you know, we always have things to remember the six million who perished, but what about the ones who survived their family members? You know, what about the ones who survived? Everyone thinks, oh, they're fine, you know, they're all in Israel, the United States, some of them are prominent, you know, uh, successful people. But when I went to Eastern Europe the first time on a basic roots trip, just to see where my grandparents were from, I found Holocaust survivors living uh, the way they lived maybe 200 years ago in tiny huts made of, you know, straw and and mud bricks and uh, living without, you know, windows, without doors, with no heat, with just no food supply. And I would knock on these doors of these little huts to talk to them and they'd be out back on their hands and knees digging up the ground because it was September and they wanted to get to their potatoes because it was their winter food supply and they wanted to get them up before the ground froze. So I was just like, whoa, I can't believe this is going on, you know, (laughs) in the 21st century, this is insane. So that, that's what prompted me to start to help because when I came back uh, and I, I was uh, just directing sitcoms and I came back to the, a sound stage, you know, I was like, I couldn't get them out of my mind. And I was thinking, I've got to help them because I tried to find charities online that were helping directly that would, if I donated money, they would give the money to them. And I couldn't find one and I still can't find one. So that's how it was born. It just started with eight survivors and now it's like, you know, in the thousands. Wow. So, from eight to thousands. And yeah. I and I wanted to ask, because we spoke a little bit about this, but to share with those listening to this, what makes Survivor Mitzvah Project different than other organizations? Well, there's a lot of things that make it different. Now, the first thing is that 100% of every dollar that's donated goes directly from your wallet to an elderly survivor right into their hands in one of these countries in Eastern Europe. It's hand delivered either by me or by one of our representatives on the ground over there or goes directly into their bank account if they have one uh, by a bank wire or now even PayPal you know, can do that. And they're all visited. So it's a very one-on-one thing. The second part is we also collect their stories because the Holocaust, there's a missing piece of the Holocaust and that's the Holocaust in the East. No one has ever told the story of the Holocaust in the East. 
And there's a fabulous writer named Isabella Tabarovsky, and she's a journalist and a scholar. And she wrote a great piece. And she said, well, what about the other Holocaust? You know, she's Ukrainian. And she said, what about the 2.7 million people? That's almost half of the 6 million who were killed outside of Auschwitz and the concentration camps because we, the world, sees the Holocaust through the lens of Auschwitz only, really. You know, we don't know about all this other stuff that went on, the mass killings, you know, Holocaust by bullets, the starvation camps, the people who were, uh, you know, cemented into walls. I mean, all kinds of insane things went on to these people. The partisans who fought in the forest teenage, as teenagers. There are so many parts of the Holocaust that have never been told. So mm. I started filming them and getting their stories because every time I hear a story, I have to go look something up and go, I didn't know that, I didn't know that. And I know a lot, but I didn't know that. And it's an, it's an amazing thing to get their stories from them because I'm usually the first person who's ever asked what happened to them. Wow. They're living in countries that where uh, their neighbors are hostile still, or they're living in countries where they might be living next door to the people who butchered their family. You know, and they can't say anything. Or they, or like a woman, I, a woman I met in Ukraine. She told me that when she was four years old, her family went to a camp called Pechora. Now, have you ever heard of Pechora camp? I hadn't. So she went with her older brother, her mother, and her father. When they got there, the father looked around and went, "There's no food here. This is starvation. I'm going to hop the fence. I'm going to go back." I'm going to sell our tablecloths and everything to the neighbors and try to get some bread and bring it in because they didn't know how long they'd be there. So he did that and he came back. And of course, as he came back, they shot him. So now it's the mother and the two kids. And it was a starvation camp. So the, the, all of the parents gave every blade of grass that they could find to their children to eat. And they all died, the parents. So the, it was just about four years later, mostly children. And the Germans were using these kids as target practice. They would they go to the river and then they would start shooting them or they were experimenting on them. They were supposed to be injected with typhus the day that uh, the war ended. So this little girl, right? She's now about nine years old. The war ends. They immediately take her 14 year old older brother to the front, right? She doesn't know where to go. Someone who knew her at that time, one of those other children, because they all stayed together through their adult life and helped each other but said she was so thin that she was blue. You could practically see through her. And so she's walking down the road. She doesn't know where to go because all she knows is that she's from Tulchin, which is a, a, you know, a town. So she's walking through the, you know, the country road back to her town because that's what most people did. And um, she smells fresh baking bread mm. and she's starving. So she knocks on the door of this farmhouse and she asks the woman, she says, please, please, can I have a, you know, a roll? And the woman says, go around back, my husband will help you. So she goes around back and she had knocked on the wrong door because this was the head gendarme, the head Nazi of the entire area. And he beat her with, he was chopping wood, he beat her with the back, not the blade, but the back of an ax. Took her a year to learn how to walk again. <sighs> he goes back to her town and this guy and his wife, he becomes the mayor. So she can't now say anything. Right, and that's how she grew up. So when I said, what happened to you? It was as if, you know, the floodgates opened and she told me this whole story she had never told anyone before. And it was so cathartic for her to be able to tell the story. And it was so amazing for her that someone cared to listen to it. And it was, I said, it, and it's so important for future generations. Look what you've just done. You've created a, 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 a chapter of an archive to tell a story that no one's ever heard. So this is going to go on long after both of us are gone. You know, people are going to be studying your story. And that brought her like amazing closure and a real, a real feeling of participating in life again, because wow. suddenly she was a teacher, you know? So it's, a, it's an amazing experience with these survivors, helping them and then learning from them. It's, it's absolutely incredible and so profound, the work that you're doing and that this organization is able to do something so directly. So if you give money directly to Survivor Mitzvah Project, you are immediately a part of this important work, um, which I think for people who don't know and aren't aware, um, 
we don't have to talk about anything specifically, but I think there is a lot of uh, misinformation about, especially with larger organizations, that that those funds don't always go directly because there just might be really large organizations. People need to get paid. There might be politics and how that the finances are, are managed. We've heard stories of all kinds. So it's empowering for people to know this. And we're excited to let our community know about Survivor Mitzvah Project because it's so important. And if you do donate, you know, we, we will tell you the name of the survivor or survivors that you're helping. Wow. So we, we figured out that basically $150 a month is a great amount because that helps them with medications and food and in wow. and winter heating fuel. So, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's not the biggest amount in the world, but it's really, really life-saving for them. And we have so many letters. We have over 20,000 letters of thanks, what it meant to, to be helped like that, you know? So it's, it's, it's a great help, but you know, if you can donate $5, you know, and someone else donates $5, well, soon we put all that together and we've got the $150 for a month for someone or 1800 for a year, you know? So any amount is helpful. Any amount is life-saving and any amount is appreciated more than you can imagine. I mean, mm. it's more, uh, it's so appreciated. No, I'm going to ask what seems like an obvious question, but I think <laughs> it's actually really important in today's world where there's so much misinformation, we've seen yeah. such a rise in anti-Semitism and Holocaust denying philosophy. <laughs> Yeah. Um, why is it so important that we tell these stories? Because if we don't know the truth of what happened as a country, like our country, our participation in World War II, or these countries' participation in World War II, like uh, Lithuania, Latvia, Ukraine, and many other countries have never come to grips with their part in the Holocaust. Um, they don't teach it in their schools. There was actually a there's a museum of genocide in the capital of Lithuania, in Vilnius, Lithuania, where they killed 96% of the Jewish population before the Germans arrived, mind you. Um, and guess what's not in that museum? Any mention of the Holocaust. So if we don't, if we can't as countries and as human beings and the global you know, citizens own what happened, you know, if the United States own slavery, own what happened to Native Americans, own, you know, all of these things that happen, we're never going to be able to move on to a higher level of either consciousness or just a higher level of, of humanity. We can't because it, we're, we're hiding stuff. We have to know the truth of what happens. If we know the truth of what happens, you know, we can, we can move forward and we can learn from it. But like today, it's impossible almost to know the truth about anything. You mm -hmm. know, uh, it's, I speak to people in Russia who are getting state TV because of what Putin's doing. And, and they have, you know, they think that America started the war, you know, <laughs> and is trying to control Ukraine. I mean, it's, it's all crazy, but that's what they believe. And just like this country has so many beliefs in it that you just can't shake anyone. 50% of the country thinks one thing and 50% 50 uh, 50 thinks another. But if we have people on tape telling their stories, you know, that's the only thing we have to see because the Holocaust in the East also, museums need artifacts to have exhibits. That's why Auschwitz is a great example of how to explain the Holocaust because they have the clothing and the eyeglasses and the wedding rings and the piles of, every, of all the goods and they have cattle cars and they have diaries and they have things that people hid. In Ukraine, when they, the, the Einsatzgruppen, which was the mobile killing squads, it was part of a thing called Operation Barbarossa. And when Hitler decided it wasn't really worth it to send these trains and get people from all over the Russian empire, you know, put the old Russian empire into Poland to kill them or wherever they were gonna do it. Why don't we just kill them on the spot? They, they fanned out to all these countries and they sent out these mobile killing squads, which there's a great book called Holocaust by Bullets, really thin, you should all read it where a French priest a couple of years ago forensically proved that all this happened. And it's great that he did this. So what they did was they, they roared into every town and village. They rounded up every Jewish man, woman, and child. They created pits. They knew exactly how many people they were going to. They had an advanced team, They're very organized, how many people they were gonna kill. And they shot them all into these pits. Every, and this priest, Father Patrick Dubois, he, he proved that everyone in the town was complicit. 
so it wasn't just like I had learned, you know, in the town my grandmother was from, one day the Germans came and, you know, they did this terrible thing. In the town where my grandmother was from, where they killed all her brothers and sisters, the Germans weren't there. It was the Lithuanians who came over the border, the death's head, you know, and they did a mass killing. So all of this, you know, um, th so there is, there's no, nothing left to, to make an exhibit in a museum. There's nothing left but the survivors telling their stories. That's why it's so critical to get this, this very few books written, very few books written on the subject. So mm -hmm. we're in an age right now where it's imperative to collect as many stories as we can and get them translated and get them out. There are archives that have a couple of stories here and there, but they're not translated, so no one knows. I wanna get this out to every kid. I want kids to know, I wanna put a human face on the Holocaust so kids know this girl wanted to be a ballerina just like you. And this guy was a sports guy. And, and we had a guy who said, I, I was you know, a, a major um, soccer player. He said, and I exercised all the time. I was in a lot of clubs, I was an athlete. So he jumped from the train carrying him to Auschwitz. And because he was like, physically fit, he was able to survive that. And for four years, he was underground under assumed names and he lived, you know, mm. but, but only because he was an athlete, you know? So I, I want them to know that they had dreams and hopes, just like you and me, they laugh, they, you know, just like you and me, but can you imagine being the sole survivor of your family or the sole survivor of your town or village going through life, just imagine this, going through life without one person that you knew from before and without one person who you loved or who loved you going through your whole life like that. Can you imagine right now not knowing one person who loved you or you loved, or you could talk to about it and say, what was the name of our grandfather? You know, they don't even know the name. Some of them say to me, I don't remember my mother's face because there's no pictures, they burned them all. You know, so it, it's, it's really reaching out to these people getting their stories, helping them and showing them that there is kindness and compassion, you know? And these people are so kind and compassionate themselves that they're amazing. If I give money to one person, I, want, I once met this woman, she was so poor, I, there was snow on her bed. I mean, because the, the roof was just, <sighs> and I gave her money. We always give them, you know, uh, American money if we can, because that's a stable currency and the other ones are not. And um, as I'm leaving, she says, of course, in a different language, I have a translator with me. Uh, can I split this with someone? And I thought, split this? What is she, <laughs> who's she splitting this with? And she says, there's a woman down the road who's worse off than me. And I'm thinking, who in the world could be worse off than you? She had nothing. I mean, she had no stove. She had no running water. She was 88 years old. You know, she couldn't see everything. We go with her, we take her in the truck. We go down this road. There's a woman whose hut burned down and she's living like just in cardboard boxes and it's snowing outside. So there was a woman, you know, so they always tell us about someone else and that's how the project grows. Someone else that needs it more. If I try to give someone a sweater, they'll go, don't give this sweater to me, I'm not naked. Give it to someone who really needs it. So they're very, very compassionate themselves and they can teach you a lot about life because they, you know, they taught me that things mean nothing because everything that they had was burned, whether it was a letter or a picture or a violin. So things mean nothing, but talking to a person and spending time with a person, that means everything. You wow. Know? Well, so for those who, who don't know who are listening, can you tell us what mitzvah means? Mitzvah means a good deed. And it's um, not just a good deed, but it's a good deed that isn't easy. So, and, and I learned that because in the early stages of trying to put this together, and it's still hard because there's so much to do and we have, you know, only four other you know, people involved in this. And I said to someone, I said, in Eastern Europe, I said, wow, this is so difficult. And he said, if it was easy, it wouldn't be a mitzvah, you know? So it's a good deed and, and, it, and it takes something to do it. But it, it's a great good deed because it, it, it's, it's a deed that keeps growing, you know what I mean? And it keeps multiplying so you know we can do good for someone and then that just takes off and something else good happens for them and something else good happens for someone else so it's always grown it's always gotten bigger we've always brought more money in you know every year and we've always been able to help more people so i think mm -hmm. i think it's a it's an apt uh name for it the survivor mitzvah project it's a beautiful name so getting current 
yeah. with the conflict in Ukraine and the work you've been doing there, what, how has that changed um, the work that Survivors Mitzvah Project has been focused on? Well, you know, normally, normally, uh, if you can imagine that the statistics that we deal with are 88% of the Holocaust survivors that we help um, live alone or care for someone who is disabled, like maybe a spouse or a child who's disabled. 70% don't have enough food. 75% don't have enough doctor care, medical care, or medications. You know, 50% of them are bedridden or blind or have mobility issues. So, um, and 65% and of them lost their life savings in perestroika and are destitute. So that's what we start with. You know, that's, that's on a normal day. So then the, the war in Ukraine starts and so many things happen at once. Um, first of all, the mail stop. So there's, because we do a lot of things by mail because we like to always stay in touch with them and they love writing letters and they love getting long letters from us. So we write very long letters and, uh, this, this has gone back and forth for years. We have walls and we'll be about 20,000 letters of testimony and thanks. And, you know, it, it's just something, a letter from America is a, as exciting now as it was in my grandmother's day at the, in the early 1900s, you know? So, so that's a wonderful thing. So all that stopped. So we had to get our, I have two multilingual people that work here from Los Angeles. And I have one guide and translator who has gone on almost every trip with me overseas. And she's Belarusian, but she's now in Poland. And so we started splitting up the list, calling some people we couldn't get in touch with. You know, some people it took forever. Some people changed their number. But we started calling people to say, how are you? What, what's happening? And one woman we got, and she was, she was in a um, bomb shelter, you know, in Overage. And she said, I can't believe it. She says, I'm 83 years old. This is how my life started with the bombs and this and that. And she says, now I'm a, I'm a great grandmother and I can't believe I'm going to die like this. Mm. We lost track of her for two days. Suddenly Ludmilla in Poland calls me on a, on a Viber call, uh, you know, a video call. She's sitting in Poland with this woman who managed somehow <laughs> to get a ride to the border, went through the border where she met a granddaughter and a great grandson who had independently all gone to Poland. They were all sitting in the hotel room on their way to Israel. And it was like, what? And she said, all I did was come with, I took my underwear and a mezuzah. She said, that's all I could grab. <laughs> so we get, you know, we wired money to her so she could have money for her new life. And she left and it was a great one. But um, I'm gonna give you just some examples of some of the things that we hear, okay? So we, like, like I said, we, we have about 350 somewhere around there Holocaust survivors currently in Ukraine. Now, um, 48 of them are between 90 and 102 years old. So that's a lot, right? The, the bulk between 80 and 89 and a couple of younger ones who are 77 to 79. And interestingly enough, the younger ones are in most cases sicker than the older ones. And why is that? Because they were born right during the war. So they were born of starving mothers, right? Who didn't have the nutrition even for themselves. So their babies were born not fully developed with, you know, they didn't have milk products, they didn't have protein. So these people earlier in life are getting really, really sick. So I always thought, well, you know, we have time to treat those people, but they're actually getting sicker earlier. So um, than the ones who at least were like 10, 15 years old, you mm. know, even 20 years old when the war started. So, um, so the most, and you, you see all the aid piling up on the news, you know, but this aid, like, you know, and there's tons of it. I mean, wonderful people from all over the world are like, you know, really stepping up and wonderful, you know, charities are stepping up. The problem is getting the aid in because they're very big. So you see these, you know, these big pallets of, of, of food and water and this, but it's for the people who are lucky enough to, to get out. Basically the ones who are stuck who, who are immobile or can't get out or don't want to leave or have no one to take them out or don't have any families, you know, they are the ones who really need it. So we were managing to get inside because we're small, you know, no one's watching us. So this is the kind of things that we're hearing. One person writes, I'm, I'm heartfully thankful to the entire Survivor Mitchell Project for your aid and for just remembering us, the old and the elderly in this difficult and complicated time of war. May God grant you all help, happiness, health, and success in all your world. This is what they have time to write us, right? 
And then one excitedly uh, says, we have received a substantial help from you. Thank you very much for your generosity support. We hear explosions, we hear sirens, age and poor health restrains us from evacuating. We hope we will survive. We experienced this in childhood and now the unthinkable is being repeated as we have aged. And um, she, another one says, we are lonely people and people paying attention to us is heartwarming. It's a big event for us. I consider you my family member. Someone, oh, someone wrote from Odessa, right? She says, me and my older brother survived during the Holocaust. Last year I underwent cancer surgery and I do not know how I will live further. Please, please help me. And after we helped, she wrote, my family and I are grateful for your priceless help. May there always be peace and prosperity in your families and may every moment of your life be filled with happiness and joy and may God protect and bless you. May there always be grace and peace in your lives. May your warmth and goodwill return to you many times. I mean, it's, it, you know, this is such thanks. I mean, I, you just feel like, oh my God, so we're able to help immediately. Someone says they need help. If we can't help at that second, we, we can help the next day. So we can get the, the money into the country in many different ways now because it used to be a lot easier. But we've, you know, new avenues have opened up as the old ones closed. And um, we're still getting aid now to also to uh, Transnistria, which is under Russian rule basically, and Belarus, which is, you know, because of sanctions are, are not places that we can easily uh, get our aid into, but we have other other ways to do it. So, <laughs> you know, if, you, if it's like show business, if you can't go, you know, in the front door, try the back. And if you can't try the window, and if you can't come down the chimney, I mean, there, there's a way to do it. If you just, you know, put your mind to it. And you address this a bit, but just to underscore it, what is most urgently needed right now? Uh, actual dollars, because there's goods will not buy what they need. They know the kind of medicine they need. We did, we did a wonderful thing with a, a group of, um, uh, really a grassroots group of volunteers who just want to remain nameless, but they're from Europe. And we got them a list of all of the medical supplies we needed. And they organized a van and they got them into this town <laughs> where one, our, our person on the ground who lives there you know, split it all up and distributed it. And some was dressings for soldiers and a lot of it just went to the Holocaust survivors. And then two weeks later, they were actually able to get prescription meds in. So we got people, um, you know, uh, insulin, blood pressure meds and all that stuff. So that's great uh, because everything, almost all the pharmacies have closed. So what's available is 10 times more expensive than it was, you know, two, three months ago. So money, t money talks. I mean, money is what you need right now. We also have the ability, because uh, we're working with um, two extraction teams, which are fantastic. They've had a lot of success getting people out of, you know, Afghanistan and places like that. But what we're up against right now is that these survivors, so many of them, they don't have any family. So it's not like they're going to go to Israel and be with family, there's no one there. So to tell a 90 year old who's by themselves, who doesn't know the language, who has a mobility or issue or is blind and uproot them, they don't wanna do it. You know, they say they, if they're going to die, they'll die in Ukraine. You know, so it may change if things get, you know, more horrendous there, but um, so, so do donations are really the things that helps. We have uh, a lot of things under control, but donations really are, are the thing that's gonna help these people. And for someone who wants to donate right now, today, after hearing this, where can they go? <laughs> go to survivormitzvah.org. And mitzvah is M-I-T-Z-V-A-H. But if you even just uh, Google probably Zane Busby, it would come up. But survivormitzvah.org. And um, you, you're going to find, uh, go on our homepage, because I'll tell you on the homepage, there's like four, there's our story, very easily spelled out. It talks about kindness and compassion. And then there are short films along the way that will show you what we do. And you can see us giving your money right to the Holocaust survivors. And, you know, we do, we do a lot of this under the wire. And I know I'm talking about it now, but, um, you know, they're vulnerable too. They're very vulnerable uh, to the gangs that have surfaced in Ukraine. You know, we have, we have to like, we never tell anyone their last names or, you know, we might say, you know, Manya from such and such, but you know, there could be 40 Manyas there because we really don't want to broadcast where these people are because they could get, you know, 
beat up, they could get the money taken away from them. So uh, they haven't yet, thank God. But we're pretty careful about that. Well, I also want to ask Zane, because it's pretty uh, incredible what you do and what you personally put into it. And between running the organization, it takes to organize something at this level to make sure that the funds are going directly to these survivors. And then on top of it, go there and be someone who is bearing witness to these stories. Um, you've already told some of them. That seems like an, in an incredible amount to be doing and receiving. How do you, how do you take care of yourself? Well, I'm, I'm learning now because you can run yourself into the ground, you know, because you think you're invincible because you're doing this, but it is going to, be, it's a 24 seven job, you know, absolutely it never ever stops because you're doing, you know, it's, it's life and death situations. So you just can't like go, oh, I'm, I'm going to go to the movies today. You know, you find yourself like you're constantly, constantly, mm -hmm. you have to take care of yourself. My thing right now personally is to just keep in good physical shape and, and, and get stronger. So I'm doing a lot of strength training because I want to be ready to be able to go back. You know, I want to be ready to be able to travel again. And that those trips, you know, people say, oh, I want to come with you, but they don't understand what kind of a trip it is. It is the hardest, most grueling. I mean, this is not a pleasure trip, you know, going to see the sites, you know, you, you just, you know, you're going, you know, we, we might see like a seven survivors a day and that's setting up and filming them and, and schlepping and going and carrying supplies. And it's, it's a lot. So I would, I would just say, have the stamina, get a really good team around you, surround yourself with the smartest people, you know, you know, you know, just, just find the smartest people, you know, who you can trust. And then for me, you know, I'm from sitcom. So I run this. I mean, people always laugh, but it's true. I run it like a sitcom because a sitcom, you have like two and a half days to put a show up and then, you know, you go to editing and then, you know, the next show starts the next day. So it's a very limited time that everything has to be done, you know, from rewrites to costumes to hair to casting, everything has to be done. So we, we know we have a production meeting, you know, we, we give out, you know, we, we check back. We have, uh, you know, basically, um, a very organized approach to like the amount of work that needs to get done and when it needs to get done and who needs to be helped next and all of that. So you, you have to be really on top of that. I Do I wish we had a bigger staff? Yes, but the staff we have is so talented and so they're so dedicated that they're doing the job of 20 people. You know, um, also, you know, it, it's what's interesting is, you know, we're coming up to, you know, the end of the war and, and victory in Europe day and you know, they're talking about peace and what that means. And, and I've heard it from the survivors and I've heard it from, you know, my parents because uh, they were, you know, the greatest generation. Um, but survivors, I, like when, when I'm looking at this letter right now, this uh, woman uh, in the Ukraine, she writes, peace, peace. What a great treasure it is. Mm -hmm. Experiencing it and experiencing war in my life, I understand the significance and the vital necessity of real peace, even deeper peace. I hope this war will end as soon as possible and peace will return. I would once again like to thank you for generosity that you have shown me. I mean, they know what it is, you know? You know, we're so lucky here. You know, we're so lucky here that we really haven't known war, you know, except for the Civil War, but I mean, in my lifetime that we haven't known it on our own turf, you know? But, you know, you, you look at places like Marimpol and where everything is gone. It's like, you know, it, it's to dust. I mean, every photograph, it's just like the Holocaust. And this is, again, you say what's different. These people in Ukraine, they are dealing with such PTSD that has been never been treated. So when they hear bombs going off or when they see bodies on the street, like in, like in uh, Bucha, or they smell gunpowder or something, that takes them right back to where they were when they were like, you know, five or 10 or 15 years old. You know, it's, it's so terrifying for them, much more terrifying than for anyone else because they know, they know starvation is next. They know like people that they love are gonna die next. They know that they could die at any moment. So it's all this uh, stress as well. So uh, in more time and this time, this is the time in our lives, you know, every generation has really their calling and their moment. This is probably our generation's moment. Early on in my life, it was the Vietnam War. We were all against the war. We all did everything we could, you know, to, to bring down that uh, war, to stop that war. But this, I think the world is looking at this. The world is watching and looking at this 
and saying, we can help. And if you can help, you should help. And this is an incredible way to do it. And I think especially for, I think we talked about this before, but the millennial and younger generations that may feel, um, you know, we have grandfathers or great grandfathers or great, you know, there's still that distance, but it's such an, it's such a beautiful way, a direct way to be reconnected to that ancestry and to those who are still surviving and alive. And um, yes. so that's a beautiful call to action for that generation as well. Yeah, it's like living history too. I mean, I always think, wouldn't it, I mean, I love history. So wouldn't it be amazing to be able to speak to a civil war soldier or someone, mm -hmm. you know, someone who, you know, in ancient Greece, wouldn't that be amazing? Well, we, we can still speak to these people who went through, you know, World War II. We can still speak to them, whether they're in this country or whether they're in another country. And from the, you know, from their mouths, hear the experience. We can still do that, which is amazing. And we can do it, you know, uh, through all kinds of electronics and things that they didn't have then, and we can preserve it, which is amazing. So I, I always say, you know, that if we help these people and we record their stories, that together what we're doing is writing a more hopeful final chapter to the Holocaust. You know, one of kindness, one of compassion, one of friendship, one of love. And that's the best thing we can do. Wow. It's so incredible what you're doing. Thank you so we'll much. Link, we'll, we'll, we'll link, put the links, you know, <laughs> everywhere for people to just do that one click. Um, and we're going to have to do a part two. Okay. Anytime. There's a whole other part of Zane's story that we didn't, we didn't get to, which is, you know, we, we love to dig into the roots of you and, and your life as a director and to learn more about that. So there will be a part no two problem. where we focus more yeah. on Zane herself. Um, yeah, someone said, I have one foot in comedy and the other foot in the Holocaust. <laughs> it's, but it's true. <laughs> it's true, but I do bring my humor to it. And, you know, I, I never, uh, uh, when I meet these these survivors, you know, I'm, I'm not like all uh, serious with them. I'm very <laughs> funny with them usually so because it That's takes important. them off guard, you know? Like I always, if there's a couple, we don't have too many couples left, but if there's a couple, I always say, so was it love at first sight? And they're like, so taken aback by that question because no one talks to older people like that. You know, like you're very, very, you know, formal and they look at each other and then they, they both start to laugh. And then I, you know, I'm right in with them. You know what I mean? I, I've, I've, I've cut out all this time being formal and, and I really get into like how much they love each other and this and how they met and, you know, they're much more relaxed. So the humor, you know, my background in humor always helps, you know, just soften the beach for the interviews, you know, so. <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, thank you so, so much. Well, thank then. you. And um, this organization is wonderful too. I mean, the fact that the foundation is putting people together and mentoring people, I mean, that's the future. You know, that's the future, you know, to pass the torch and, and use everything that you've learned in your life and give it to someone so that everyone doesn't have to start over reinventing the wheel. There's so much knowledge. I look out at the Hollywood Hills and say, there are so many people who are sitting in those houses, you know, who could give so much to the younger generation of filmmakers and no one's asking. No mm. one's asking, what's your story? What do I do? You know, how do I, you know, how do I do this? How do I, you know, use the camera to, you know, unfold the emotions in the space? There's so many things that we could be asking that we don't ask. So. I just say mentoring is one of the greatest things that you can do. So I appreciate you asking me in and I appreciate the time that you spent with me today so much. Thank you so, so much. Mm -hmm.